let's kind of get started. I can skip through the little intro. You guys know who the heck I am. Um, we still want to have fun with it, so I want you guys as much as possible to unmute yourself. One thing I don't love about Zoom is the interaction. I don't get the energy and the vibe from the room, so if you could help me out by talking to me so I don't feel like I'm talking to myself because this is not a webinar. This is a workshop where you're supposed to help me um, interact with you guys, especially because this is, topic is really important with negotiations. You guys are on the front lines. You guys are negotiating contracts, and I like to get a pulse on how this material is really involved in interacting with what you got going on, okay? So, like I said, you know who I am, so I don't have to worry about that. You know our peeps, so if anybody needs anything, reach out to all of us. All right, so today we are going to kind of dive deep into negotiation styles. There's actually some different, so when I go through them, you're probably gonna be like, ah, that's got why that guy on the, that realtor was like that. So we'll dive a little bit into this. We're not gonna do a ton about this, but I think it's really relevant to a conversation about um, why people say certain things and that why people react a certain way. And then we're gonna learn two models today. We're learning BATNA and SAM. Um, and then we'll, tomorrow, same time, same channel, we're gonna be learning uh, the success model and the ACE model. And then we're gonna dive into really a mastermind in the last 20 minutes about multiple offers, kind of how we can overcome uh, and get your clients to house, okay? So that's kind of the agenda for today. And like I said, if you can unmute yourself, um, I'm gonna monitor the chat box because most of you guys, I would love it if you can just kind of unmute yourself and chat with me that way. It's hard for me to chat and talk and see the box at the same time. Okay guys? Good? Unmute it. I can hear you say yes. 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 <laughs> all, right, so, all right, so what we talked about um, kind of in our last series, if you were joining us, and I just want to make sure, the re sometimes when I hear the word model or system, because I know at least at Palo Williams Bay, we throw those words around a lot. If you look at page one, really models are supposed to be so you can have, it can be less complicated. You can visualize this kind of path. So it's simple, right? So when you're negotiating a contract, whether it's a listing, a buyer, you're negotiating with your spouse, partner, <laughs> just kidding. Um, you can kind of think visually as you go through. That's why models are so important, right? And so we kind of talk about the entrepreneur versus the business owner. And if you remember this from the last one, you can obviously go into action and then you'll have a result. It just may not be the best result. This is probably the most important in negotiation. You can probably a half day with very quote, little experience negotiate your way to a, a solution, but it may not be where the destination you want to go to. Uh, so I want you to think about it. I want you to use the models so you can have better results, which is obviously your client getting what they need out of the transaction. All right. So let's dive into... Um, kind of the challenges that we have right now. So, have, um, yep, go ahead, Ben. I'm sorry, Drew. Okay. But on page one, um, are we kind of filling this in as we go? Did I miss success is less? Yes, let me back up real quick. Yeah, so, I've missed. Um, success is less complicated than most people make it. And okay. then models are ways to visualize the actions that lead to success and the path and then the most simple manner possible. Yes. I have so, less fill in the blank this time because feedback. I got like, you. And the entrepreneur thing was thinking and, and um, something. And models and then models. better results. So we kind of, this is like that magic formula. This is kind of like the silver bullet. You know, if we go into action and we think about it and we use a model, gotcha. we have better results versus if we just go into action and get results, you know, it could be. Gotcha. Right, Thank so, you. Sorry. Absolutely. No, you're perfect. That's why I want you to interact with me. And um, so I'm not talking to myself. Um, so we also, we already know we have low inventory, but we also know we have low, you know, loan interest rates, which is causing people to kind of get off the couch and ready to buy. But we also are having a lot of high emotions, probably more now than the, at least the 15 years I've been in the business. Um, and then our prices are insane right so I think our negotiation skills are more important now than ever and it doesn't matter if you've been in real estate for five minutes or 50 years 
no real estate agent has gone through what they're, we're going through now. So I hear all the time that agents will say, well, I've been in the business for 35 years and they don't have any advantage that you, they don't have any more of an advantage than you do. So they're new to this environment. They're new to the climate that we're in. They're new to the strategies that we're going to talk about because none of this has existed in our lifetime, let alone their lifetime. So first of all, that's a negotiation tactic. We'll talk about that in a second. That is, they think they know more than you do. They have more experience than you do. And that's not accurate because they don't have any more experience in this market than you do. You've entered this market just at the same moment that they have. So <laughs> that you can navigate this on your own. Does anybody, does, what is your thoughts on when people say, I love that Janet's on here because she's been in business for a while. Like when people kind of throw their weight around that says I've been in business for 20 years, what's, what's your approach or opinion of that statement? Well, two in the last three transactions that have been in the business over 40 years and it's different. And I think it's just the things that they're doing online. They're not updated or they're just old school. And it's really frustrating to think that keeps telling me, well, I've been doing it for this long, but the big major mistake in what they're doing. Right. I'm having a little hard time to hearing you, but maybe it's, my, maybe it's my audio. Yeah, but I think. No, it's, it's I, I think, so Jenna, can you get closer to your computer? Yeah. Is that better? Do, you think that'll help? Um, so you're just, they're feeling frustrated just as much as the new agents, right? I guess so. Um, you know, we, I don't know exactly how they're feeling, but they just keep trying to impress upon me when I'm asking a particular question. I can't think of a good example that they've been doing it for all these years. And then in one case, the gal was describing to me, just what you're saying, that she had been doing it all these years, was running up against these things that she thought were just crazy. It had to do with the lenders and some of the regulations and all those things that were piled on. So yeah, they are as frustrated. But just... Yeah, and what I also find is that they aren't reading the contracts yeah. Like, yes, 20 years ago, but the contract has changed every year to two years. So what they think is on a purchase agreement isn't even on the purchase agreement anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I hate to coach them through it, but it's a conversation of, like, have you read the most current July 2020 purchase agreement? Because it doesn't say what you're saying that it says. Because yeah. there's been many revisions. And so I think some of the challenges that I would like to kind of discuss as we go forward is that when you're negotiating a transaction, experience doesn't really give them any more leverage than other than intimidation or a little bit of, um, they feel like they're taking the lead, so. And Drew, my, my, my problem is I feel like I, I want to say things because I'm looking at an offer that was presented by someone that looks like um, they've been in this a while, maybe five or six years based on their reviews. And I mean, for one thing, they put in other terms like the um, first right of refusal information, like this sale is contingent on the house. I didn't get a first right of refusal. It's just weird things that, you know, I feel like we've learned that's not there. And, but I, I do have a certain amount of anxiety because I don't want her to think, girl, you don't know anything. You, you just started. Why yeah. are you telling me my contract is not? But it just seems like it's a few things in her contract that don't make sense. Well, my response to that is, is that your fiduciary is to have all your documents protect your client. And so if they're not providing accurate verbiage or documentation that's that creates that protection, which we'll talk about a little bit later, then, then you have to see something. You could say it in a way that says, hey, I'm curious, you know, I've always been trained and coached to use form X, Y, Z, and I'm just curious why you didn't use that form. Is, did something change that I'm not aware of? So well, kind that's of good. curiosity in a different way. Um, and then they may give you a, an answer that's not correct, or they may just kind of BS their way through it. But I do think you need to be able to, and we'll talk about that a little bit on the learning on the negotiation styles um, in a second. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I think that I'm gonna actually, I 
started diving deep into this, I'm a little nerd when it comes to data, is uh, National Association of Realtors puts out every year a survey from buyers and sellers, and it's a long document. It's like got tons of great information. But this is um, what real estate agents, I'm sorry, sellers say they want from a real estate agent. Just recently, it's just created, it was published a couple months ago. And it is saying, if you look at number six, help with negotiation and deals with buyers is the fifth, kind of the highest, I'm sorry, the sixth, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, sixth highest thing that sellers want. Which I find is interesting. I think that's probably, that used to be a little bit higher. Um, but sellers want your negotiation skills because they know that you're, they're going to have to negotiate home inspection repairs and whatnot. But the biggest one that I thought was interesting is this is the buyer side. This is the buyer saying, what do I want from a real estate agent? And number two is help buyers negotiate the terms of the sale and then help with price negotiation. These all come from that. So my interesting idea or question, I guess, is that buyers want help negotiating the term and the price, but we're in a seller's market where most of the properties that we're selling are above asking or at asking or very little closing cost. So how do we have bridge the gap between a buyer wants, literally you can see they want us to negotiate really good terms and price when we're in a market so tight right now. What are you guys saying to your buyer clients that's giving them some assurance that you're still going to provide negotiation skills, but it may not be $20,000 off the price? I just, I just went through this with somebody and I basically had to just tell them that the competition that's in the market is so incredible. And I love my favorite word. Unfortunately, if you really love and want this home, we're going to have to go through a different strategy by, you know, maybe waiving a home warranty or an inspection. And unfortunately, and I hate to ask you to do this because appraisers may or I was hearing you, but now I can't hear you. Yeah, so my question was, I love the word unfortunate. Why are you choosing that word? Because I want them to know I am protected. Oh man. I can't hear you, Kim. You're doing good. I don't know if it was just something what slightly changed with your audio. So I use that word, unfortunately, to let them know that I'm protecting them and that I'm saying to them, unfortunately, in this market, if you really want this home, we're going to have to go in a little bit higher. Under normal circumstances, I might say, okay, this is what the price is and I could defend you a little better. But because of the competition, if you really want it, we're going to have to go in a little bit higher and we should do an escalation clause. And I'm asking people to do the escalation clause at the $2,000 mark because everybody picks $1,000. Yep, and a lot of people different. put a ceiling on it at $10,000. So I'm saying if you go to eleven dollars or $13,000, you've got a chance of winning. And well, I love the right. way you said that because your negotiation is just getting them to win the offer. So changing right. it from a thousand to two thousand, or changing, and we'll talk about that tomorrow a little bit. But that is negotiation, right? You know that agents are going right, so you're going left. You know they're putting a thousand dollars in, and you're putting two thousand. So that's a negotiation tactic all in itself. So I love the word people, I feel sorry for them that, you know, we're in this market, but if this is something you really love and you really want it, you know, I want them to know that normally I could negotiate prices a little bit better, but I can help you win this sale if you really want it, you know? Absolutely. Love that. Well, the reason why I put these two slides up is I think we have to start this. We need to have a conversation about negotiation skills at the buyer consultation and at the listing consultation. If you don't have a slide or in your presentation, whether it's the buyer or the seller, I would recommend you literally go to NAR Profile Home Buyers and Sellers. I screenshot this particular slide, put it in your listing presentation, and then on um, that's the listing one, and then put that in the buyer one. This is what they are saying. The consumer is saying what they want from us. Right, and so you could grab this slide and when you're in the listing presentation that says one of the top 10 things that you need, or at least what 
sellers are saying they need from me as your realtor is my negotiation skills. And one of the things I pride myself on is really being skilled and really knowing the pulse of the market on how we can win in certain areas and negotiate better terms for you. You say almost the identical thing in the buyer side and say the interesting thing is the top three things that a buyer looks for is obviously finding the right house, but negotiating the terms and the price are in the top three. So you need a buyer's agent that has really strong negotiation skills, especially in this market, because unfortunately, taking Kim's word, unfortunately, you're, you're, you're going to have to be competitively priced, but we can negotiate other terms and other conditions that still put you at an advantage, right? So there's some language in there that I want you to hear that I want you to bring to the forefront right at the beginning. Because if we go through this two-day workshop and you're really becoming much more intentional on a, on a negotiation model, but they're not telling them that that's what you're doing, you're kind of leaving that off the table. So be upfront about that's part of your value proposition to your seller and your provider. Because that's what they want. You're giving what the consumer is asking for. Does that make sense? So how many points of negotiations do you think I'm on page three of the workbook. How many points of negotiations does a real estate agent interact with in one transaction? Anybody have a guess, a number? Does anybody think how many points are you negotiating? Like with who, seller, the buyer, your client, loan officers, like how many, how many points of negotiations in a single transaction? Seller side or buyer side? What do you think the number would be? About 10, 10 or better. 10, okay. Say 20. 20? Anybody else have different numbers? I'm going to go 30 something at least. 30 plus? <laughs> All right. Anybody else? So the interesting thing is, is that these are just a few examples that I wrote down that kind of came to mind and we'll kind of walk through a few of them, but there's on average 96 different points of negotiation and transaction on average, that'll go up and go down. And so you are always negotiating. You're negotiating the minute you walk in at the listing appointment, all the way down to the closing, right? Even negotiating at open houses because you're having a discussion of like what they want versus what they have, what is what they need, right? So obviously we're not gonna go through every single one based on time, but we, we know that your negotiation on price, commission comes up, listing details, what you think is important versus what the seller thinks is important to highlight personal property, earnest money, buying, closing costs, warranty, home inspection, repairs, appraisals, fee, referral fees. If you got a referral from maybe another agent from across the country that gave you a lead. And then your emotions between your clients, their family members, vendors, and so on and so forth. So I would say that out of all the skills that you need to focus on as a real estate agent, if you're wanting to increase your price points, sell more properties, or get your first property under contract if you're completely new. Practicing and really focusing on how to be the best negotiator is where you need to start. And so it does dovetail into the questions workshop we did uh, a couple of weeks ago, but the negotiation skills really can put a crack in your armor if you're not really focused on doing it correctly. So there's a ton of value in that. That's why, in my opinion, Zillow can't do our job because it can't negotiate for us. It can't interact and weave and bob and, uh, and flex to emotion. It can't come up with creative solutions that are legal, ethically, and moral to get you to the finish line. It can't do that because it's a machine, right? So you guys bring that, can you, that human connection, and that's because you allow it yourself uh, to interact with the negotiation within the transaction. So the key thing is, is that we got to be careful. So I put Switzerland up here because I want you to think of it. We are Switzerland. We are the facilitary, facilitary, functionary, fiduciary of the transaction. And so sometimes when people, based on their negotiation style, come into the transaction or the relationship with high emotion, it can really be the deal color. So if you're looking at the bottom of page three, minimize or eliminate emotion within the transaction allows you to get the deal done deal done right so you've got to come into it like you are switzerland so i would personally recommend you not using words like our house or our money or our loan or, or 
It's your client's loan. It's your client's house. It's your client's. You are not actually a part of the physical transaction. You're the fiduciary that facilitates. And so many times when I interact with a client, I'm sorry, with an agent, I hear, well, my client will never take that offer. Well, that's not for you to say. You need to bring it to your client and they need to make the decision if they're going to do an offer, right? So make sure you're using words that really allow you to say, I'll, re I'll review this with my client. I'll let you know what my client says. You know, the house, not my house. Have you ever heard any agents use words that you felt like they were more emotionally invested in the transaction than they should have been? Yes. And what words were they saying to you? What were they saying to you that you're like, oh crap, I think they are more emotionally connected to this deal than they should be. What were they saying, Kenny? Well, I just did the son-in-law was the agent. <laughs> yeah. That's a example where somebody's emotionally attached to the deal. Yeah. Uh, and some of them just, they, they, they almost get angry when you come to them with, with like you're, it's a personal front to them was right. being separate from the whoever they're representing. Yeah, there shouldn't be having any fluctuation in their emotion. There shouldn't be anger or happiness, sadness. There shouldn't be. It just should be, this is what you presented. I'm going to present it to my client. I'll let you know, right? So I think that's the one of the first things in negotiation skills is that we really have to keep your emotions between the lines. You are Switzerland. You are not really, in my opinion, through years of it and coaching people, you come into it emotionally charged, you're going to really kill the deal. And it's hard to keep a bad deal together when you're already emotionally charged or the other person is. Um, do, you, do you ever get pushed back? Because I, I feel like sometimes um, uh, being, I try to stay real neutral, um, positive, but neutral. But I feel like sometimes the sellers they're like, well, well, what do you think? Like, like it's almost like they really want you to get, I, I just draw, have a hard time balancing what um, comes across as neutral and what comes across as uninvolved. Who you're fighting for your client, right? Right, right. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I think one of the things that we got to be careful, so what I'm hearing you say and what I experience myself is that you want to make sure that you show your client that you're fighting for them, right? So if you represent the buyer that you're kind of going to bat for them, or if you're representing the seller that they feel like you're negotiating the best price or term Correct. for them, right? So I think the first thing is making sure you un they understand that, you know, you are, you are the, you're the lightning rod. You're the grounding point for the transaction, right? So yes, I'm going to fight for you strategically. I'm going to use negotiation strategies to get us to the finish line, but I'm not going to show our hand and get emotional, right? And then you can get frustrated and maybe the buyer can get frustrated, but I and the other agent need to be kind of that central ground, that Switzerland, that, that neutral ground. Is that okay that we take that negotiation strategy approach? And they're going to be like, okay, Right? And, I said, and I said strategic negotiation strategy, right? So I have a strategy. It's just not throwing lighter fluid on the, fly, the fire. It's strategically placing my position to where I can get what I want. Does that make sense? So I would use language that would, would support that you're, there is a strategy, but you're not going to use an emotional strategy. Okay. So. So real quick, and we'll kind of hop into a little bit of the styles, which what you've already alluded to, Gwen and, and Penny is there is that competitive person versus that collaborative. I'm not going to read all these, but a competitive person is they really just want to win. Um, they withhold information. They're aggressive. They have abusive behavior. They have no really concern for the relationship of their client or your client. They just want to be, it's ego driven. Collaborative person, which when you were kind of mentioning is concern for other parties, exploring options, they build trust, trust, but they, they exchange information like it's you give them something you gain something else do you ask questions they ask questions right so there is literally if you're kind of looking at it kind of in a boxing ring um there's two approaches to negotiation um both have consequences if you're not using them correctly which we're going to talk about 
but this is the three if you're looking in the kind of the workbook on page four that I want to kind of define what what are we so we've always heard just because KW's model is collaborative is win-win but competitive is win-lose so if you look at that lose is in capital letters compliant um, is lose when but lowercase that's the one that I see is the most deadly uh, we'll talk about that in a second and then collaborative is that win-win right where one's you ultimately both win but one has a little bit of feeling like they have a little bit more of an edge right now the sellers have more of that big win than a buyer right um, so let's talk about this middle one though the compliant one so let me go through competitive is pretty you've all seen it they just want to take they just want to knock you over the head and beat you over the head and feel like they can they have control over the transaction and a lot of transactions right now the sellers feel like they can just take what they want and if they you don't like it you can they'll put it back on the market and get another offer but this is the one that i would say the uh, compliant one is the most challenging one it's um you just want them to make everybody happy. You don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable. You want to be liked. And I would say that's the one, this is the one that we need to be really careful of because I don't want you guys to be that in the in a situation where you're super compliant when you're in negotiation. You're there to give take, to go back and forth. But you're not giving, giving, giving. So make sure you're being really strategic when what, what, what the words you're saying to the other agent or to your client or to anybody else you're interacting with. Don't, you know, what is that saying? The loose lips sinks sit ships. Like be really careful. This person usually wants to talk, talk, talk. It's usually this person tells more information they should. And when you're in a negotiation situation, you gotta be really careful about that. I call it push pull. And so you gotta be really careful. You wanna you know, push, meaning give them a little information and then pull back and see how they're, they're going to reply to it, right? But I think this particular one is the most challenging. This is the one we want, is that collaborative where, you know, it's a give and take. You can build on each other. Um, and this is the one that I think that takes the most effort and time and you have to think about what you're asking and some, some of that. So this is the tactic guide. I want you to think about these are the types of negotiations of people that maybe you've come in contact with. So have you ever had a deal or a transaction where you're either talking to your seller, if you represent them or your buyer, or the agent on the other side, because a lot of times we're negotiating with our clients more than our agent. And the, and the person just keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Well, I gotta get 250, I gotta get 250, or I gotta do this, I gotta have that. If they're having that broken record concept, then that's actually a negotiation style. They may not even realize they're doing it, but they're doing it because they're trying to emphasize to you that that's their hot button. And unfortunately, sometimes it's a farce. It's actually not real. Um, you need to interrogate, well, if you say you need 250, wh where did you come up with that number? How did we get to that conclusion that you have to get? If you got 248, would that kill the deal? And then good guy, bad guy. This one's probably the most uh, common I see when um, you have a spouse or a partner, like, you know, I don't know, I have to talk to my wife, or I don't know, I have to talk, talk to my business partner, right? They can't make their own decision, or they blame it on someone else. You know, I would take this deal, but my wife said we have to get 250, or we can't move, right? So we got to isolate why that they're doing this good cop, bad cop is another terminology that we hear. Um, good guy, bad guy, that is, a, it's a tactic. That's what they're doing to throw you off and you have to be able to say, okay, well, what can we do to get you both on the same page? Because if you're in agreement, but your spouse or partner is not in agreement, why don't we need to get on a Zoom call together and figure out we can meet a you know, meeting of the minds and figure out how we're going to move forward together? Because you got to call that bluff a little bit because they're all, I mean, I do it. I get a telemarketing call. I get somebody that wants to, me to buy something. And I was like, you know, I'm not sure I need to talk to my wife, right? It's just a, I need to get off the phone. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I don't want to have to deal with telling you no. Has anybody ever dealt with broken record or good guy, bad guy? How yeah. have you guys overcome those type of negotiation tactics? Either one of those, broken record or good guy, bad guy. 
just ask questions. The broken record, when they keep saying what they have to get, what they have to get, something I read in um, some of the material somewhere um, just kind of puts it back on them. Like people aren't going to offer you that price because that's what you need. They're going to um, offer you the market value of the house. That's that's the only time I've used that one. Yeah, that's a great yeah. example of that, right? Y yeah. And that's even when we were talking about questions uh, workshop, when you use keyword backtracking, so you use their words again, and you're, so you keep saying, or you keep repeating to me that you need 250. Well, if you could just either write it down or kind of walk me through the math on how we, why we have to get to 250 so I can have clarity on what the end goal is. And a lot of times they can't get to the number that they just verbally said to you because they didn't even work it out in their head or on paper, right? It's just a feeling, just a gut instinct. A lot of times I do this in coaching. I'll say, hey, you're new to real estate. Hey, how much do you want to make in real estate? Your first, you know, once you kind of get up and running. Do you know what the number one answer of income is when you become a real estate, how much money it is? 100,000. Million dollars. It's 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody really knows the point of reference, like you don't know what a realtor makes or you may, you don't know, you know, how long it's going to take the income. Then the number one, I mean, there's a few examples of exceptions, but most real estate agents, when I say, Hey, how much do you want to make in real estate? They all say a hundred thousand. No. When I dissect that number, then I tell them how many transactions and all that good stuff. Yeah. Then the number modifies up or down. But it's the same thing with broken record. They're saying something generic because they just want you to get off their trail. They just want you to get off of that so you're not interrogating them in that negotiation. So when they're doing that with a repair addendum or anything, and they just keep saying the same thing over and over again, that's broken record. And good guy, bad guy, it's kind of the same problem. Walk away and bluffing. Those kind of have, you know, obviously it says, this is our final offer, um, would be kind of a bluff. Um, also walk away kind of has the same thing. You've got to figure out what is their walk away and their, are their bluff there? So you kind of, have you had anybody in negotiation say, take it or leave it? Like this is our final offer. No, yeah. I haven't had that yet. Yeah. Has anybody ever had that? Cause it is, yeah. I feel like that right now is probably the number one thing that people are saying. I have is, on the buyer side. I've had the seller say, this is the lowest we'll accept. And we had, as buyers, had to walk. Right. So I think you have to call, figure out, call that bluff. And so reversing that would be, some, you know, hey, we all, we're at 350 and you want to walk away, or you're telling us you would walk away. And then you show the gap, right? So we're at three, you know, 340 and you're at 350, we're $10,000 away, and you're willing to walk away over 10 grand. So, so literally, where is the gap between us walking away and us getting the deal done, right? You got to push into what that walk away or that bluff is because everybody, we're going to talk about this in BATNA, everybody has another option. There's always a plan B. There's always something else that they have up their sleeve. There's always another option. They're just not willing in negotiations to share that with you because they feel like that's a card that they can hold uh, to their chest, right? Um, have you ever had anybody say that's all I can afford? Yes. And yeah. then have you seen them pay more money? Yes. Why do you think they say that? Because they worked out their numbers in their head and they think that's all they can afford. But then when you start saying, showing them areas they could cut costs, they haven't thought of that yet. Yes, I think that's a great, so showing them, and I call this chunking it down into the small numbers. So again, we con constantly use the, you know, $5, what is it, um, for every $1,000, right? That kind of ratio there. So they're like $2,000 away, and they're like, that's all I can afford is two twenty five. dollars that's all I can afford. And then I would literally say, well, we're $2,000 away from getting this, getting you the house, which is like a cup of coffee a day. So you're saying that you can't afford two additional cup, you can't afford two cups of coffee a day and buy this house. It's perspective, right? It's the conversation of all I can afford versus 
So if you buy this house for $2,000 more than what you can afford, but we know it's going to increase in value 3% a year because that's called just average appreciation enrichment, you're literally going to make up that $2,000 in less than a year. So you are going to pass on this house and you're actually going to make it up in, in equity before the, even the next year turns around. So can you afford it? Or are you just not willing to kind of look at long-term as a solution for you getting the house, right? You got to isolate that a little bit. And then intimidation, loud, they interrupt you, or the complete opposite, very extreme, is they're super silent. Have you seen people when you're negotiating and you're like, feel like tick tock, tick tock, nothing, no, they like they're not texting you back, they're not calling you back, they're not doing anything with you at all? Yeah. Do you think that's deliberate or do you just think that's bad time management? They're just kind of at the beach or do you think they're strategically being silent? I think they're being silent. Both. Yeah. I think most of the time it's strategic, right? Because silence in a conversation makes usually people uncomfortable, right? So if I feel like I don't have the upper hand, I'm going to give you some silence because I want to see how you emotionally attach to that. So if you're on the receiving end of silence, make sure you realize that could be a strategic negotiation tactic. So rather than saying, why haven't you replied to me? Or I called you three days ago and you haven't replied back. I would kind of reframe that and say, hey, my clients have some additional you know, thoughts on our negotiation, wanted to get an update from you. Well, now they're going, well, what is, what is, he, what is additional information does he, is he trying to provide? Or what are they changing their mind? So it's almost like calling their bluff with that silence. How the, the intimidation one, how do you guys overcome loud interrupts? You, you've probably had that type of agent or client where they just have to be that center of attention or that loud kind of bowl in the china closet. How do you approach that type of tactic? I just, I just tell them, tell them well, put up with it. Yelling and carrying on like that, if you think this intimidates me, you're sadly mistaken is what I do. I love that. So that, that kind of takes, you literally kind of take the bull by its horn and say, you know, that you yelling and screaming is not going to cause any any solution. Anybody else? I see you in quiet today. AC is there. I that word, unfortunately. But unfortunately, yeah. we're both trying to work for our clients and in a situation where you know, we've got to come together. We've got to find a way to work it out. What do you think we can do different? What do you think that one of us could change? Or I throw the questions. I love the questions. Yep. Intimidation it needs to be put in a form of a question instead of a statement, I think. I mean, I totally agree with Kenny, but I would rephrase it that says, hey, you seem very excited on the phone, very passionate to, to be able to kind of, quote, fight for your client. And yet, what do you think we could do to get this to the finish line to where everybody's able to make this happen? Because that's just kind of arguing or really talking in a loud, aggressive way isn't getting us any closer to getting the deal done. Don't you agree? Well, and I, I don't know if it's the right thing to say because I'm still learning, but I had somebody who didn't respond to a contract and a deadline and we offered more money and all of that. And she just didn't even respond to me at all. And I said, unfortunately, we're in a situation where things are getting ready to expire. Can we work this out? And then I got a response right away. And then somebody was kind of negative to me. And I said, don't forget, we're all a team. We're colleagues. We're trying to make a deal work for everybody. Can we work this out as a team? And then they're like, oh, well, maybe I am part of a team. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying things. I do think that people don't realize that we're all threaded together. Like if one deal, one thing doesn't work for your client or for our client, we all go down. Like, and we're all working to get right. it. So, so I'll, let me just go spend four to five minutes on this. I put this in your workbook so you can actually, um, on page six, you can kind of dive in specifically. The areas that I want you to kind of zone in is will you know, you will notice. So you will see those kind of right near the underneath, right above limitations. So if you're a dominant personality, that what we call the high D, your self confidence, your directness, your forceful, and your risk taking. The I is someone that's charm, enthusiasm, sociability, optimism, and talkative. 
The S at the lower right there is patient, team player, calm, good listen, good listener. And then if you're the C, your precision and analyst skepticism and quiet reserve and quiet. So sometimes when you're negotiating, you think it's a tactic, it's just how they're wired, right? So if you see somebody that's really fast paced when they're negotiating with you, you may get the interpretation that they're, they're, they're pushy, but you may have to run up to their pace a little bit, kind of mirror and match it, same with charm and energy. Eyes do really well in negotiations because you can kind of get in there and say, oh, I love your sweater or, oh, I love, I mean, it's stupid. It's Sorry, not stupid. Things that as a Heidi, I wouldn't do, but eyes are great at that. And that's called a pattern interrupt. When you're in a heated discussion and then you randomly say, oh my God, I love your sweater. I'm like, really? I mean, what is happening right now, right? But that's part of you dealing with so if you need to use that, go for it. And so if they're also quiet, if you're negotiating with someone and they're not replying to you, they're not responding to you, they're processing the information, that's okay. They're looking at the facts and they're analyzing that information in their head before they're gonna verbally vocalize it out loud. So don't demand an answer for that type of profile because they're gonna be really irritated that you're demanding them to, to kind of give a solution when they're not ready fully to to, to get through the facts. And number C is the probably the most interesting one, is they're very calm. And sometimes it comes off that they don't care. In fact, they actually care the most. They're the most team player of all these profiles, but they come off in a different way. So this happens a lot when you're interacting with them face to face. Um, so if you're ever in negotiation, realize you really have to look at these um, and kind of work your way through. You also see in this example, these white squares. These are the transitions between the people. A lot of time we're mixed, right? So DIs, there's a DC going down. There's an IS and an SC. So these white spaces here with the words, that's kind of how they bridge the gap between the personalities. Most of us are not one personality. We have a, a blended version of this, okay? So just wanted you guys to be aware of that. All right, so let's dive into the first model. Um, how many have ever heard of BATNA before? Anybody heard of it? No. No. Well, it comes from the book, Get to Yes. So it's actually an old, like, classic book. I feel like a business book that everybody should have. Um, but it's very relevant to what we got going on in our market right now. So BATNA, if you're on page seven, just kind of write it out, is best alternative to negotiated agreement. So in my opinion, it's the, it's the plan B. It's the other option if this deal doesn't work out. So this is a good gut check model, in my opinion. So if you're representing a buyer and they're kind of getting grumpy, they're like, man, I offered my best price. Now they're nickeling, nickeling and diming us. They're not giving me the closing costs that I needed. So now I'm going to have to pull it out of my savings or right 401k. You've probably heard those conversations with your buyer, right? So a BATNA technique is really going to dive into, okay, so if we don't get this deal done, what's, what's your plan B? Like, what is your backup option if we don't get this house for you? And then don't talk. Like, let it simmer. Well, I mean, I want the house. I need to buy this house. I got to move out of my rental in three weeks. I'm already going to be inconvenienced because we can't even get the deal, right? They're going to they're gonna tell you their bat now. They're going to either tell you what they can do, the alternative option, or it's going to be there is no other option. And you need to negotiate more with your current client than the agent itself. So when you're not getting what they think they need, you need to use bat now. And you need to say to them, all right, so you are not happy with the way things are kind of being negotiated out. What is your, what is your alternative? Do you want to go look at the other house that, we, that was your number two? And do you want to go back to that house and negotiate that house instead? Do you want to continue living with your parents for another three, two or three months? Because you know inventory is low. We've been looking for 30 days. We haven't found any other house that might meet your criteria except for this one. Does that make sense? The other yes. part of BATNA is you need to make sure you're aware that you're telling 
the BATNA of the other side of the coin, the other prospect. So if I represent a buyer, I'm gonna say, you know, we submitted your offer, but I want you to be aware of the seller has got four other offers. And what they're doing is they're looking at the best option for them. And that could be price, that could be the loan type. And I know you said you wanted to do FHA, but you could do conventional. But conventional is gonna make you look better. It's gonna look like you have more skin in the game, more cash down. So it's gonna make you look like a stronger buyer. But if we put it in as FHA, they're gonna pick an alternative price. They're gonna pick an alternative contract and we're not gonna get the house for you. How do you feel about if that happens? Do you hear the way I'm doing BATNAS through that? Then reverse lens of the other side of the coin. Do you guys think you use BATNA now, which you just didn't know it was a model or an acronym? Do you guys feel like you do? I do. I have learning. <laughs> okay. So I think I used it too much. <laughs> we'll say that again. I think I used it too much. Um, you know that first. Um, listing I have that I, the lady said well are you working for me or them and I was trying to do both <laughs> so I think you got to think about that I love that you said that because I think you're right if you go too far in bat now for the other side of the fence they do think that you're working for them the other person right so I would recommend to think of it like tennis you've got to put the ball on both sides of the court you've got to hit the ball on both sides of the court so yeah, you're yeah. gonna you're gonna talk about the seller like hey they you know they're looking at offers that probably look like A B and C and they're kind of seeing all those alternative options, and then you got to flip it back to them like hey do you really want I mean if this doesn't work out what is your plan B what do you think you're gonna do moving forward do you, are you really willing to spend another two weeks in the car to look for another mm -hmm. house when we know this house is the one that you really it fits all it checks all the boxes that you told me. So I think make sure you do both. You can't bat it on one side because they're gonna feel like you're actually stating the case of the opposite party. And I think that's maybe where you went a little bit um, heavy on one side and not balanced it out on both. Does that make sense, Gwen? Yes, 100%. So I think, so um, bat not is in the bottle uh, in the book, Getting to Yes. It's a good book. If you haven't read it, uh, it's a good audible for you guys to, it's an easy book to read. Um, but it also prevents you from giving away any type of power because you're giving just like switch costs what we talked about in the questions workshop a couple of weeks ago. It gives them, gives you choices. When they tell you what their bat net is, you can use it either for them or against them. If they say, ah, oh, well, you know, if this house doesn't work out, I'm not in a hurry anyway. I'll just go live with, you know, stay living with my parents. Okay. Well, their bat net, their alternative plan is to go just live in their house, uh, live with their parents. You know that's not what they want. You know that was the pain point when they came to you at the buyer consultation. So make sure you're using their bat now against, you know, in a way to do that. What are you doing if this deal doesn't work, does not work out, right? That's that powerful question that I think you kind of need to, and I don't, I don't think we always use this question because we don't want to be the negative person. We want to tell them rainbows and sunshine. This is like a perfect deal, perfect house. It's all going to, you know, we're all going to go down the yellow brick road and we're all going to get to Oz. And uh -huh. you don't want to pattern interrupt and say, well, what if this still doesn't work out? Because you're in the honeymoon phase with them, especially when you work with buyers. They're so excited. You're excited. They finally are writing an offer because you've shown them 65 houses and you've been working with them for six months. And if you ask them this question, it may plant a seed of doubt. Like, what do you mean? Why do you think this deal isn't going to work out? Do you guys have a fear of asking that question? What I said, do you, do you sometimes pause or hesitate asking that type of question because of that? Yeah, I think especially in this market, I've almost done like, we need to be prepared if this doesn't work out. Like, what is our plan B going to be? Because it's such a multiple offer situation in it's good. You, 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 you're asking that powerful question. You're not shying away from it. You're like going right in it. You're like, this is not rainbows and sunshine. This is great. We'll write an offer. We'll get it, you know, ratified. You're, you're saying, Hey, what's our options if this doesn't work out? Good. I think that's, you have to use that batnet constantly in this market. That's why I think it's so relevant. I think it's the timing too. 
I, I, I mean, maybe when you ask it, you know what I mean? Like, Usually, um, BATNA needs to be used at the most stressful point. Okay. Right? So when they're, when you can see their body language change and they're uncomfortable or there's something that has changed in that negotiation that's getting them a little frazzled, you need to really go, all right, I, you know, I'm reading your body language. I'm kind of seeing like something's kind of changed. Like, are you worried that this isn't going to work out? And that's why it's kind of, I'm feeling like there's something else going on. And then they will say, well, you know, I, I love this house, but I was just worried that maybe there's going to be water in the basement because, it, you know, that slope <laughs> of the land or, uh, or you know, I, I love the house, but now that we drove by, the traffic is a lot heavier than I thought it was, right? So that's, you need to hear that. Like when that, when we talked about with, uh, when you ask questions and you see the change in their environment, that's when BATNA needs to be inserted. Like, all right, so if we don't get this home inspection tied up and negotiated kind of to make it a win-win and you're out the $450 for the home inspection, we got to do all that again. Like what's your plan B if that, if that happens? Hearing them answer that question is really important. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's go to the second one for today and then we'll be done and then I have a little bit of a, um, like a, a study that I want you guys to do before tomorrow. This is called the SAM model, S-A-M, um, stand position, area of concern, and then their, mo then their motivator. So think about it again, just like that pyramid or SAM. So if you're looking at um, page seven, you'll fill in that graph according to what you see on the screen. Um, the one thing that I love about us, the SAM model is number one, it's easy to remember because it's three letters. Um, the first one is, is make sure with SAM, that first one is stand position. When someone says like that's, this is my final number or I'm not bending to that or I'm not fixing that, you know, that, that light fixture or, or you know, I, the, I've lived with this for 20 years and I'm not gonna get this, I'm not fixing this for the buyer, right? There is something in the negotiation that they're standing on top of, but they're saying that they're not gonna change their position. I don't want you to go with that one. I don't want you to start to fight that fight. I want you to move down. So don't get distracted by the first one, which is um, And then the A is area of concern. So what is underneath that original position? Like you gotta dig in. So the A and the M is where you really need to dig in with questions. So don't, it's a camouflage when they say, I don't want to pay $2,000 more for this house. That's the S, but then you need to ask the A and the M. Ask questions that identify areas of concern. All right, so what about the $2,000 is getting you hung up? Like where, where is it because you don't want the monthly payment? Is it because, like where are you getting hung up on that makes the, uh, that we're the most concerned with? And then the M is the motivator. You need to ask a second question that ties back to why you know that they want to do this, right? It says, hey, you know, Josh, you said that you wanted to move out of your parents' house and buy this house because you were sick of living underneath, you know, your parents' thumb. You wanted to kind of have your own place. You wanted to have a backyard so you can enjoy, you know, entertaining and things like that. So. I, explain to me how that's changed because that's what you told me when I first met you at the Starbucks when we did a buyer consultation. That's the M. That's a motivation question, right? So the AM is the most important part and it'll go, then you tie it back to the S. It says, hey, Josh, you said that you don't want to pay $2,000. Like that's your flag in the sand. You're like, man, I'm not going to do it. Yet we just identified that that's like two, two cups of coffee a day. So it's not... And it sounds like financially you can do that, correct? And we just talked about how great it's going to be that you're going to be able to entertain in the backyard and not have to worry about you kind of living under your thumb with your parents. So don't you agree it's just the right thing to do is just to move forward and let's accept the, the counter offer the way that it stands? You hear how the SAM works? Mm -hmm. It's an easy one. It's great because I think it allows you, but it ties back. So I restate the SAM. So I skip S 
go to A&M, and then I restate Sam in a more of a statement with a conclusion or that tie down. Remember what we learned in questions? I use that as a tie down. Doesn't that agree? Don't you think that we should accept the counter offer like it is? That's a tie down. I'm tying him to a conclusion that makes sense for him based on the solution. What do you guys hear about that model? It's Did good. You, you all, do you all ever get people asking you what you think? Yes. What, when, uh, does anybody, so Glenn says people always ask, what do you think? What are you guys' responses when people say, well, what do you think I should do? Or do you think I should accept the $2,000 counter? What do you think I should do? What do you say to that? I'm going to reverse it instead of answer it. I'm going to ask, what, do you guys get that same question? And how do you reply to that? It's how bad do you really want this house? And are you willing, by looking at the way that the interest rates are right now and things like that, when you originally set that number in your head, things have changed. I think- Yeah. It can, it keep fluctuating back and forth. I don't know if it's just me. And you're, well, I would say yes, that I would do something like that to them. I'm honest with them because yeah. like that's two cups of coffee. I mean, how bad I can look and see my future and know that I'm going to have a return on value. Yes. What is, what is this um, two cups of coffee again? Are you, did I hear you so say? I'm uh, literally chunking down the price. So I'm taking $2,000. Uh-huh. And it's like $5 a thousand. For a mortgage payment. For a mortgage payment. Got you. I use so that like all the time, right? Got so you. the kind of general rule of thumb, because interest rates are so low, it's like $5 a thousand. So every thousand okay. dollars we go up in the payment. So okay. it's it's 10 bucks, 10 bucks a month. Different. It's the difference between two cups of coffee. Got you. And it's every time, right? So it's uh, whatever it is. So if it's a high amount, you may you can't do 25 cups of coffee. That would be weird. Um, you may want to chunk it down in percent. So I know that we're we have a gap, and you want to pay 300 versus 325, right? But if you look at it in the big scale of things, what is that like three percent more, right? And we know that you're going to appreciate that. So all I'm going to do is take the lower of the number. <clears throat> like I'm not going to say 10,000. I'm not going to say 25,000. I'm not going to say 2,000. I'm going to try to chunk it down. Um, that's just a strategy to kind of get them to think in a much more narrow space rather than such a wide number. Um, well, I like Timothy's response. It sounds like she said she's honest, and um, I do that too, but then I throw it back at them. Um, I'll, I might say, well, I think um, I think it's a good offer, and then I go back to the Sam because you said you wanted to blah, 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 blah. But um, then I'll, I'll get scared and say, but ultimately it's up to, <laughs> up to you. So I don't know. So I won't ever answer the question if I think it's a good offer. I just won't okay. I, I would say this is your money, this is your house, and this is your decision. What I can do is as your kind of advocate is I can tell you the pros and cons of, the, of, of it, and then you have to ultimately make the decision. Is you gotta sleep there at night. You gotta be feel comfortable with the money that you're spending. It's the money you earned and you've saved over the years to make this your dream. So for me to answer that question wouldn't be fair because it's not my money, it's yours. And I don't live there, you do. So I think you, if you, because the problem is if you ain't agree with them and then something goes bad, they're gonna point the finger that says, well, you told me this is a good idea or you told me I should have done this. So I, I do not recommend renegotiation. Relationships, you border on that side of building relationships where if somebody asks you a question, like one of my last clients said, was she said, I love because you give me your honest opinion what you would do, and I value you as having a relationship and having good common sense. That's why yeah. I chose you because I trusted you. So well, I, I, I love that. Be careful that you don't, you know, push so much back that you seem cold. Exactly. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I think, yeah, I mean, you make a good point. I think at a certain point, they're going to want you to give a straight answer. But you don't want to be politically correct, I think, is what you're saying, is you want to really give them. But I think it's just really important that you frame it in the sense that this has to be your decision. This is your property. That, you know, yeah. If, you know, I, 
so I would just be careful. That's all I would say. And it would, especially when you're dealing with friends, it's even a little bit more challenging. Now you're going to be at dinner parties with them and everything else. And if you don't love their house, then it becomes a challenge. So last thing I want to do is just kind of um, almost play a game with you guys. This is in page eight of the workbook. This is Sam. So write um, down the initials of SAM that you think this statement is. So remember that Sam is is the stand position area of concern or the motivator. So I won't pay more than 5% commission. What is that? Stand S. Perfect, that's correct. I can't afford to pay 2,000 more for this home. A. Correct. Um, I'm concerned about how much work this home needs. A. Someone other than Gwen, although Gwen did awesome. Anybody else? A. Correct. I don't want to give my house away. Oh, that's ordering M, maybe. I um, I had it. I had it as an A. Okay. Area of concern, because what what's but I it could be M, but I think it could be what is what is giving your house away, like. So, anybody think that's an A or an M? What is what is your second? Input? So, Kim, you think it's a an M? I anybody had. A. What did you say, Catherine? Sorry. I had A. You had A. I had A. And then um, the last one is M. I think my friend will be mad at me if I don't hire her as my realtor. That's completely based on emotion, right? That's a motivator. So we need to figure out, like, how do we make that a win-win? How do we get to the point where she's still comfortable hiring me and she's not going to be kicked out of the friend pub, right? Because she's concerned from some emotion motivator that's connected to that, right? So that's kind of the first two models. Um, and then basically, you can't shake hands with a clenched fist, right? So you got to go into it with an open handshake approach because it's not I mean well maybe now again we can do some fist pumps because we're in COVID world um, but tomorrow we're going to go into two other models it's called success and then ace and then we're also going to talk about how we need to build trust because we talk about negotiation but if we're not building our trust with our current client or the agent on the other side of the aisle none of these tactics are going to work none of these strategies none of these models the two models that we use today and the two we learn tomorrow are going to work. And then we're going to do a mastermind on multiple offers. All right. So the last hey, one. Yeah. Hey, yep, yep. Can, Can I have 15 before everybody goes away? What did you say? I'm sorry. What did you say? Can I get 15 seconds of time before everybody hangs up? Sure. Well, let me just finish the last thing and we'll okay. be happy to do that. Yep. Real quick. So here in your self-study, um, you guys are on page nine. Do you guys see that in your workbook? I'd love for you guys, we're going to do BATNA and we're going to do SAM model as a case study. So I won't read it to you, but basically the, you have a buyer client with BATNA. I want you to ask quest BATNA questions to the listing agent and to your buyer, right? So I want you to kind of use the space on that page and write out the questions that you would ask to kind of discover at BATNA. Remember, which is that, that, that plan B, that strategy. And then the second one is you're representing the seller. And I want you to do the SAM questions. And I also want you to do it for your seller and then you, and the buyer's agent as well. So write down those questions that you think would represent both of those case studies and scenarios. And some of it's pretty generic. So you need to go in there and kind of dig, dig deep into what the questions would be. And then make sure you text it if you read on the side of it, text me when you get that done, because I'd love to kind of review those as your coach to make sure you're kind of understanding both of those models in the right way. All right, so um, tomorrow we will be working on like those final um, things. So we can kind of kind of do a deeper dive and more aggressive um, models for that. All right, Kenny, you guys need to hop off, go for it. But Kenny, what, did you have a question? I was going to ask here to be the inspirational opener tomorrow. <laughs> so this had nothing to do with negotiating. 
I'm ne negotiating, negotiating the thing. right now. Who yeah. wants to help Kenny out be the inspiration opener? You guys all are inspiring. I should, I should uh, nominate someone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, anybody want to help Kenny out? You guys have inspiring stories. It doesn't have to be necessarily or a video that you watched. We'll get with Kenny. Just poor guy. I feel like he's just been doing it. <laughs> How many times have you done it? Like three times in a row? Yeah, that's all right. What's your uh, cell phone number they can text you when they say yes? 337-6343. <laughs> Everybody write that number down and text Kenny. Yes, but in the uh, business meeting on the 23rd this week. Oh, you're right. It isn't tomorrow. Kenny, make sure you they switched okay. it to Wednesday because it's uh, we have a, a guest person, uh, Pam O'Brien's doing systemi systematize your business. So it's not tomorrow, it's Wednesday. Okay, even they better. See, that's great information. You haven't spoke the whole time and that was the best <laughs> verification there is. All right, so hopefully you guys can um, kind of dive into a couple of these uh, models and I'll see you guys tomorrow at 10, all right? Thank you. All right. Bye, thank Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks, Drew. Bye-bye. Absolutely.